so to this point, we focused on decisions and actions in the boardroom, and we've been concentrating on the board and senior management team. But in this module to start with, let's move out into the hallways level, and we'll remind you of the context that we're talking about. This is mainly the more junior and mid-level employee interactions and decision-making and how culture impacts and is impacted by what happens on an everyday basis as staff go about their work. In Chapter 1, we talked about the tone from the top and how important it is in driving culture from the senior leadership. In this module, we want to look at how that tone filters throughout the rest of the organization. And just like in an old pinball game... That message from senior leadership gets bounced around as it makes its way through the ranks. The bumpers of the pinball machine are the middle managers that intercept and shape and morph the messages as they interact with their own staff and colleagues. We often hear the culture at the mid-level of the organization referred to as the mood in the middle. The actions of middle management are essential for making sure that senior leadership's commitment to ethics isn't derailed. Mood in the middle is at least as important as the tone at the top. The company's managers and employees who are actually responsible for the day-to-day interactions with clients and suppliers and so on are the ones that are implementing the policies approved by senior leadership. It's these employees that, in many ways, have the most direct control over the company's contact and broad reputation. So let's drop into our first conversation in the hallway. In this scenario, we're going to visit the office of a government ministry. The ministry has a code of conduct that all employees are required to read and acknowledge annually, and to support the code, each department receives annual training that the department staff and their managers all attend. The accounting and finance group has just finished their annual training, and two of the staff are talking about the session afterwards. So, let's join them. So, you said you missed last year's session with fieldwork, so was this your first time attending this training here? It was, and... Honestly, I had pretty low expectations going in, but it was nowhere near as dry as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. It was actually kind of fun. And I thought the trainer, what was her name, Tatiana? I thought she did a good job of keeping the conversation moving. Yeah, that's a pretty common reaction that I've heard. She does a pretty good job at keeping it lively and relevant, and I think the case studies help a lot. True, I like that they were based on things that actually happened here. Or in similar offices, anyway. Now, speaking of things that actually happened, you know when Tatiana did the anonymous poll on whether we had felt pressured to go against the code of conduct and like 40% said yes? Did you see the look on Lily's face? Mm-hmm. She looked really uncomfortable that the group that she manages would have such a high number. Yeah, that was awkward. She's looking around like, who said that? I'm surprised she doesn't have a better idea of what's actually going on around here. I mean, the training is great, and I do get a sense that the higher-ups are committed to doing things right, but... Lily's not the most helpful on that front. I I can't see going to her if I was being pressured by someone to do something inappropriate. I agree. I I think she'd probably panic and make it worse. (laughs) Well, at least Tatiana did talk about other options for reporting issues if we aren't comfortable going to our own manager. True. Oh, shoot, I've got a budget meeting in a few minutes. I better run. Okay. We'll talk about middle management's role in terms of training and other tools in the next module, but for now, let's focus on what this exchange tells us about Lily's contribution to the mood in the middle. What do you think? Well, the staff's comments don't give us a lot of faith in Lily as being a positive force in terms of promoting the organization's ethical culture. So, what are some ways that we can amplify rather than mute a positive tone from the top. Here's some ideas. Of course, the obvious first point is to be a good role model, meaning that you should make a point of evaluating the ethical facets of your own decisions. Proactively figure out the ethical risk areas that you may reasonably be faced with in your department so that you don't get caught off guard. And whether decisions are being made by yourself or by the team, run major decisions through an ethics check before they go final. This involves ensuring that the decision is not offside of any company policies or laws and regulations as appropriate, and further that it's aligned with the mission, vision, and values of the organization. It also means using the front page of the newspaper test. In other words, consider how you would feel if the decision were made public. Would you be able to stand by it as the best decision? This can help you and your staff decide on what the best course of action should be. Another idea is to post the organization's mission, vision, and value statements on the wall where your department meetings are held, 
or put these on placemats at each seat in the meeting room, which we've also seen. Consider spending a few minutes having your team agree on how these statements can be reflected in the context of your department. This helps make the organizational mission more relevant to staff. In terms of more general guidance, you should expect and demonstrate fairness and respect among your team members. If you expect good behavior from your team, you'll often get that back in return. Next, be transparent. If there's an information void, misinformation will usually fill that in. Communicate regularly and openly to keep people informed as best as you can within the boundaries of privacy and confidentiality, of course. And also, be honest and genuine. Mean what you say and keep your word, and of course, expect the same from others. But recognize that you don't have all the answers and you're not perfect either. So own and correct your mistakes and move on and help the rest of your team do the same. Throughout all of this, one thing to be aware of is that if you supervise people, your actions will have more of an impact on their perception of the organization's ethics than anything else. And what they see and hear from you will be reflected in their own actions. Remember the earlier quote from Emerson, what you do speaks so loudly that I can't hear what you say? It's just really a longer way of saying actions speak louder than words. So if you're anywhere among the middle layers of management, you have a real ability to impact the mood in the middle and your decisions and actions matter a lot. So what do you do when you run into ethical dilemmas? The better that you are at managing those situations, the better you'll be at modeling effective behavior for ethics conflict resolutions and the better that you'll be at coaching your staff to be more resilient as well. Naturally, this will also help build better future managers within the organization too, as you're a positive role model. And to that end, we want to introduce you to an approach that's been around in academic circles for a number of years and has gained popularity with forward-thinking universities when they design business ethics curricula. And more recently, we're seeing it gain some recognition in the professional environment as well. The approach was developed by Mary Gentili, and it's called Giving Voice to Values, or GVV. The basic premise of GVV is that needing to figure out what the right thing to do is often fairly clear, so we need to go beyond that. GVV asks a different question, that being, once I know what I think is right, how can I make that happen effectively? And by effectively, we mean including without getting fired, having to quit, being retaliated against, and so on. This approach tends to resonate with us as professionals because in many situations, we do have the means of figuring out what's right, but finding the courage to speak up can be where the real challenge comes in. The GVV approach recognizes that not everyone approaches situations the same way. Let's listen to Mary Gentili describe her early research that formed the basis of applying the approach at different levels and by different types of people. But I had this experience um, where I was doing some consulting um, for Columbia Business School at the time, and, and I had the opportunity. They were asking all their incoming MBAs to write a little essay about a time when they had experienced a values conflict and how they'd handled it. And the largest group, a little less than half, did, in fact, say, yes, I encountered a values conflict. It, it was not what I wanted to do, but I really didn't think I had any options. So I just sucked it up and did what they asked me to do. But there was a, and there was a small group who said, yes, I had a values conflict and I really couldn't imagine what I could do, but I also couldn't bring myself to do it. So I either quit or I got myself transferred to a different work group or a different manager. But there were about a, a third of them who said, yes, I encountered this values conflict and I tried to do something about it. And some of them failed. But about a quarter of the whole group said, yes, I, I tried to do something, and by my lights, I was successful. And so I started looking for interviews, people who had, in fact, found ways to voice their values to try and figure out, well, what is it that made it possible for you to do this? And we started to feel that maybe that's what we should be focusing on in our teaching. And so I sort of thought, geez, you have to be brave, you have to be extroverted, you have to be, you know, aggressive and assertive to be able to stand up and do this. And what I found instead is that, you know, some folks I would interview and when I asked them why they were able to take the stand would say, well, I've always been kind of a risk taker and I, you know, I like stirring it up. But there were other people who said, well, I've actually, I've always seen myself as kind of a cautious and fearful person. And so that was where they drew the strength to do this from. And so I really realized that 
if you preach to a cautious person to be bold and morally courageous, you're not going to get that far. And if you preach to a kind of risk taker, assertive kind of, uh, you know, hard charging business person, you have to be more cautious. You have to play it safe. You're not going to be that effective. And so what I ended up realizing is that the tool is that these people took control of their own experience and framed it in a way that made it comfortable for them and played to their strengths. People thought creatively about just in the way they might want to sell some other idea within an organization if they want to make some other kind of organizational shift. They thought about this as as part of their work as opposed to some sort of you know moral cause that I have to stand up on Tuesday and do and then get back to work on Wednesday. So as Professor Gentili explained, finding a way to positively influence the decision-making in your organization, and thereby promoting the right tone at the top or mood in the middle, it's about finding a way to strategically pitch your ideas in a manner that fits your style and the situation. There will still be times when we need to dig in our heels and just say no, but often we can use the GVV approach to reframe the situation and make it less confrontational. So rather than asking, isn't that unethical? We can try something less value-laden like, what are the reputational risks if we go that route? Or how would our customers respond if we took that action? By framing the questions more in terms of outcomes rather than moral judgments, we can increase the likelihood of bringing about better actions. And by teaching our staff to do the same, we can arm them with the tools to think creatively and handle ethical situations that they face. And both of these can drive the mood in the middle to promote a strong ethics-based culture in our organizations. So to recap this module, we want to emphasize that we all have an important role to play in promoting an ethics-based culture. And in particular, the various layers of middle management that supervise teams throughout the organization have a particularly influential role to play given the sheer number of staff that they collectively supervise. So we'll break here, and in the next module, we'll revisit the ideas of diversity and inclusion from the perspective of the hallways. Let's start right in with our conversation. We're visiting the head office of an oil and gas equipment distributor. The company has operations and sales teams in several countries, but the head office is a pretty small group of about 50 staff in accounting and finance, marketing, technical communications, and human resources. Let's stop into the lunchroom where a few of the professional staff from the accounting and finance department are having lunch. So the guy says, well, I need to know if I should expect you to try and talk me down on the price, steal it, or blow it up. Oh, hey, Dave, you should really stop with the racial jokes or you're going to end up with a complaint from HR. Oh, come on. They're just jokes. It's not like I'm actually serious. I know, but still, we're supposed to be professionals. (laughs) Does that mean I can't have a sense of humor? No one on our team is going to take offense. I mean, come on. You've heard the jokes that Marcel tells about gay people, and he's gay himself. So I don't think we need to get overly sensitive here. So what do you think of that conversation? As another member of the team in the lunchroom, how would you respond to Dave at this point? So undoubtedly, you're thinking something like, I'd tell him that there's absolutely no good excuse for that kind of talk in the workplace. It's against the law. It goes against the profession's ethical principles and against every company code of conduct that's ever been written. And you'd be right, of course, and that is the textbook answer, but that probably won't actually show Dave the error of his ways. So let's try again. How would you counter Dave's statements that no one is going to be offended and that others in the office joke at their own expense as well? Dave's justifications for why insensitive jokes are okay is a pretty common one. 
Some people will complain that political correctness has gotten out of hand or that we're becoming just too sensitive. It's also relatively frequent for people to think that it's fine to make fun of their own groups, their own culture or gender or what have you. It's easy to say that if no one in the group is offended, then an off-color joke does no harm. But there are a couple of problems with that argument. First off, if we accept these types of jokes as being harmless, this has the effect of making them seem more and more okay, which then further marginalizes some groups of people and perpetuates negative stereotypes. And just because no one disagrees with bad behavior, that doesn't make it okay. That's sort of like saying it's fine to feed our children nothing but chips and candy as long as they don't object. The second problem with the no harm done justification is that how can you be sure that it's not offending anyone or making them uncomfortable? This is hard to know based on our need to get along and be a team player. It may be our immediate instinct to laugh or smile and roll our eyes or at least not speak up even if we're actually not in favor of this kind of attempted humor. This is often grounded in a fear of being excluded if we don't fit in. Belonging to a group is a strong motivator, especially in a workplace where we invest a lot of our waking hours. And depending on a person's confidence level, this may be their reaction, even if the joke is about a group that they belong to. The Human Rights Commission in New Zealand has actually launched a campaign they call Give Nothing to Racism. The campaign stars director Taika Waititi, who was voted New Zealander of the Year for 2017. Waititi uses satirical humor to get across a powerful message. The New Zealand campaign points out that even if we're not the one telling jokes or making comments, if we accept a no-harm-done attitude and passively go along with the flow, we're still, passively at least, encouraging that behavior. At the outset, we all agreed that racism or otherwise discriminatory language has no place in our organizations. At least we'd better all agree on that point as it's enshrined in statute. And in an earlier module, we looked at the issue of diversity in the board and senior leadership, and we talked about the importance of setting the right tone from the top. But how does that translate into the hallways? If we're not in an executive position, what can we do to make sure that our teams and departments are inclusive? And that word is worth repeating, inclusive. So it's not just about making sure that our teams have a mix of different cultures or that they're gender balanced and so on. Inclusion means that the team not only has a mix of people and perspectives, but that everyone on the team feels valued as part of the team, regardless of their gender, race, sexual orientation or identification or age. So we're talking about diversity in the broadest sense, including all of the characteristics that can make us different and unique. So how can we promote inclusion at the level of the organization where the day-to-day -day work gets done? To some extent, the specific influence each of us has will depend on our role, whether we have a group of staff reporting to us and so on. The best thing we can do to promote an inclusive culture is, you guessed it, be inclusive. Ultimately, this requires us to appreciate people's differences and to harness those differences in making decisions and getting the work done. But more specifically, what can we do? Here's some suggestions. Pay attention to your own biases and recognize that although bias is normal, it can get in the way. And this requires self-awareness and conscious effort to identify our subconscious perceptions and then challenge those assumptions. If we actively seek out broader experiences, we tend to lose some of the assumptions that we may have had and we gain new perspectives. We can also make it a point to ask questions and make the department a safe place to explore differences. It may sound like going back to kindergarten, but if you have a multicultural team where people don't necessarily know much about each other's cultures, getting team members to explain something about their own culture or religion to the rest of the group can be a starting point for communication and bridge some of the potential awkwardness that comes from other people simply assuming things. Have you ever noticed that we sometimes refrain from asking questions because we don't know the right terminology and we don't want to offend somebody by saying the wrong thing? Now, this may be less of an issue if your team is somewhat younger and if you're in a larger center, because a lot of people in that demographic have had the benefit of growing up in an environment where they're surrounded by classmates and peers from many different backgrounds. But if your team is more traditional, so to speak, encouraging them to explore their differences can help the team gel and dismiss some misconceptions. Next on the to-do list, have an open-door policy and mean it. 
And when people come to you with questions, avoid being judgmental. Being inclusive means being open to other ideas and refraining from judging an opinion until you've evaluated it more fully. Next, train your team, or better yet, bring in a professional who can guide your team through exercises that increase sensitivity and break down barriers. You want your staff to be comfortable bringing up issues with each other and working through differences of opinion, so training them on how to speak their mind in a positive way can be very important. And finally, create opportunities for different people to work together. If collaborative work is required, mix things up rather than always assigning tasks to the same groups of employees. The more opportunities that people have to work together, the more chance they have to recognize each other's strengths and appreciate each other's different opinions and perspectives. And just to take a step back here, let's not lose sight of why diversity and inclusion are important in the first place. Not only does this support equity and fairness, which are important goals in their own right, but they're also fundamental to the long-term success of the organization in a number of ways. First, organizations that are more inclusive are more attractive to a wider base of potential employees, including demographic groups that have traditionally been underrepresented in the workforce. And inclusion is becoming a more important factor in attracting new talent when we look at what the younger generation of workers value when considering a new job. Millennials are more likely than Gen Xers and boomers to consider diversity and inclusion an important factor. This trend toward placing more importance on diversity is important because the millennial generation now represents the largest generation in the workforce. Millennials have surpassed Gen X and Obviously, the trend is just going to keep increasing as previous generations retire and the post-millennial Gen Z also move up in the workplace. This means that if your organization is going to be able to attract and retain good staff in the future, it needs to pay attention to getting this right. In addition to the focus on equity that we talked about earlier, be aware of the shift in how we think about diversity and inclusion. Previous generations framed diversity in terms of demographics, equal opportunity, and representation of identifiable demographic characteristics. Inclusion was demonstrated through the integration, acceptance, and tolerance of gender, racial, and ethnic diversity within the organization. And all of this is still important, but diversity also needs to be thought about in terms of having a mix of unique experiences, ideas, and opinions— and respecting individual identities and how they identify. So, for example, we want to strive for cognitive diversity as well as the traditional demographic measures. And then inclusion is not just about gender, gender identity, race, and so on. It's also about perspectives, experiences, and histories. So having said that, if we circle back and remember the significant amount of influence that middle managers have on the culture of an organization— what all of this means is that whether or not you have direct input on who gets hired in your organization, you do have indirect input. The more you help your organization create an inclusive culture, the more desirable that your organization is going to be as a whole. So attracting employees is one key benefit of diversity and inclusion, but what other benefits are there? Well, having a diverse team also broadens your reach and ability to connect with customers and other stakeholders. And we're starting to see a larger trend that larger companies, at least, are asking their suppliers about their commitment to goals like diversity and other socially beneficial initiatives. These companies are choosing to support organizations that are seen as being strong on these fronts. So this means that as a manager, you can harness that diversity in your own team to expand the organization's business. So we'll conclude this module here, but just to sum up, there are certainly a whole lot of good reasons for middle management to be paying attention to diversity and inclusion, both in a very broadly defined sense and finding ways to build those kinds of teams in their departments. As we said earlier, organizational culture ultimately comes down to the relationships and the trust that's formed throughout the organization. And striving for everyone to feel valued as an important member of the team is a big part of that.
chapter one, we spent a couple of modules talking about tools and systems to support and develop an ethics-based culture, as well as methods to monitor the culture and ensure accountability. In this module, we're going to look at these same topics, but from the role of non-executive management or staff. To get us all back into the topic of tools and resources, remember that these elements need to be aligned with the organization's mission, vision, and values in order to contribute effectively to an ethics-based culture. And we group these into two categories, those that help encourage appropriate behavior and discourage misconduct. Those were things like codes of conduct and training programs. And the other category was those that encourage reporting and reduce the threat of retaliation. This included whistleblowing systems and focusing on a speak-up, listen-up culture. As we go through this module, we'll make the assumption that the organization has a reasonable set of tools and resources in place. If not, then the best thing that you can do is to start encouraging senior leadership to pay more attention to the need for these kinds of systems and programs, to protect the organization's brand and value, to enable it to attract and retain the best talent, and just all around to be a good corporate citizen as society is coming to increasingly expect. So then, assuming that these systems and tools are in place, What can you do within your own team to use these tools to promote and enhance the ethical-based culture? Before we answer that question, let's listen in on another conversation. In this scenario, we're visiting the hallways of a larger not-for-profit organization, the Larimer Foundation. So the foundation has recently decided to implement a third-party anonymous whistleblowing system, and the accounting staff have just been told about the new system in their weekly department meeting. After the meeting, a couple of staff are discussing the upcoming system. Wow, a whistleblowing system. This place is sure getting corporate. I remember when there were only five of us here and we barely had a policy manual. All in the name of progress, I guess. Yeah, it makes me wonder what they think we're up to with all this focus on fraud and theft and so on. Don't they trust us anymore? Yeah, but what I'm more worried about is that we're going to have to start watching every time you correct someone. You know what I mean? These millennials can be so sensitive. I can just imagine that the next time I ask someone to correct a report, they're going to file an anonymous complaint that I was mean to them. (laughs) Stranger things have happened. But seriously, do you really think it's anonymous? Not a chance. So if you were the manager that these two employees report to and you overheard their conversation, what would you do? There are two presenting issues that you may have picked up on. One is the need to better communicate the reasons behind introducing the whistleblowing system and how it's expected to be used and how anonymity is maintained. Obviously, the messaging around the system remains a bit unclear. You could assure the staff that Having these systems in place is common in larger organizations of all types these days, including not-for-profits, and that stakeholders expect them to be in place as an indication of the organization's commitment to ethics. You'd also want to stress that the intent is not to replace the normal channels of reporting. As their manager, they should still be bringing any concerns that they have to you, but the system is there for reporting serious matters that represent violations of the code or the law, or particularly sensitive matters. But you'd want to emphasize that it's not intended to be used as a means to report interpersonal disagreements or things of that sort. With respect to the anonymity question, here you have to be really careful. It's important to set expectations appropriately. Whistleblower systems do have inherent limits on anonymity. Remember that these systems, even if they're externally managed, have to feed the report back to an appropriate person within the organization. That doesn't mean any information about the reporter, of course, just what they said. That does mean, however, that if I make a report, I need to choose my words carefully if I don't want to be identified. If, for example, I file an anonymous report that says that my supervisor, Fred Smith, is bullying me so much that I had to take a week off and the coworker who sat next to me quit last month for the same reason, then how anonymous is that really? So if someone filing a report is really concerned about anonymity, then they'll need to be a bit careful about how they report an issue. And you'll want to make sure that your staff gets this concept. Having said that, it's not uncommon for a whistleblower to reveal their identity voluntarily once they build some trust in how things are being handled, assuming, of course, that they're handled appropriately. But revealing their identity has to be on their terms. 
If the system is seen to be untrustworthy, it's not going to be used at all. And if that happens, not only are the potential benefits of the system lost, but trust can be eroded in the organization as a whole. So obviously, there's a need for better communication about the new system. But the other impression that you should have picked up on is that the department's team spirit could use some work as well. It sounds like there's an opportunity to improve the inclusivity between different generations using some of the earlier guidance from the last module. So now let's return to our earlier question. What can you do within your own team to use tools like the code, training, and so on to promote and enhance an ethics-based culture? One of the most important things that you can do, as usual, is to lead by example. So with respect to the tools and systems, this means that you need to be on top of the resources yourself and to make use of them. This is the only way that you can help the rest of your team become more familiar and comfortable with those tools. And here are some other ideas for bringing the organization's code of conduct to life within your group. In regular meetings, make it common to spend a few minutes talking about any ethical issues that have arisen for staff, referring back to the code of conduct directly to make the connection. Now, naturally, you need to be selective here given privacy and confidentiality considerations. But this will help the team better be able to recognize situations or risky areas for them to be alert to. You're also likely to find that the team will come up with suggestions for making the code more intuitive or user-friendly. And these suggestions can then be passed on to the group responsible for maintaining the code. Taking this one step further, if you have other professionals in your team, you may want to compare and contrast the organization's code of conduct with the codes of the various professional bodies and use the opportunity to highlight the similarities, as well as point out some of the uniquenesses or differences between the code and the organization's code. Another suggestion is to ensure your staff are given time to attend ethics-based training and debrief with them after they've attended that training to see what their reactions are. Again, this can generate feedback to help improve the programs in the future, as well as opening communication lines and signaling to staff that you recognize the importance of the training. Next, remind staff of relevant policies when certain events or decisions are approaching. For example, consider reviewing the gift and entertainment policies as the holiday season approaches. And if you're the academic type, you could even offer to help develop or review the training materials. As a professional, you should be more familiar than many people with codes of conduct, so your insight will be very valuable. And if the training group is external to the organization, then your perspective can be particularly helpful to make sure that they've got the organizational context and terminology correct and consistent. So those are some ideas of how to support the ethical culture by focusing on the code and the training program. Now let's move on and talk about how you can encourage reporting and reduce retaliation. We've already talked about whistleblowing systems in the earlier conversation scenario, but what about reinforcing the policies and procedures for reporting and some of the other tools? A key element is just making sure that staff understand that they, like you, have an obligation to bring any concerns that they have to the right people's attention. The person they should bring matters to may be you or it may be someone else, depending on the reporting structure. You should be reinforcing the message that the employees are part of the solution with respect to building and maintaining the culture. You'll also want to make sure that staff know where to find the information about how to raise those issues. For example, they probably won't be comfortable coming and asking you how to use the anonymous whistleblowing system at the time that they actually decide that they need to make a report. If and when your staff does raise concerns with you or report suspected misconduct, recognize that the situation is stressful for them. It's probably stressful for you too, of course, but that's why you need to be particularly careful about how you react. Regardless of how you feel inside, this is a time to stay calm. Recognize that the person bringing this to you probably thought long and hard before walking in your office, so the last thing you want to do is make them regret that decision. Take a deep breath and start by acknowledging their efforts and thanking them for coming forward. And make sure you're not coming across as judgmental. You also need to keep things objective and encourage your staff to do the same. Get them to focus on the facts and distinguish between what they know and what they think or suspect. And here you have another balancing act to perform. You need to avoid assuming that the person being reported on is guilty, while at the same time not calling the reporter's judgment into question. Asking, are you sure, 
could come across as not believing the person reporting, which can then put them on the defensive and reduce their trust, but you obviously do need to complete your due diligence. Consider framing the discussion in terms of, I need to understand what details that you're really sure about and what details you suspect. Get them to go through what they observe systematically so that you can understand the issue in full. And always make sure that you properly document these discussions, which probably goes without saying. Finally then, walk them through the process that's going to be followed, and once you've compiled the notes that you need, verify those notes with them to make sure that you accurately understood their report and that your information is complete at this point. Okay, let's shift gears again and talk about your role in the measuring, monitoring, and accountability processes that go on in the organization. And this brings us to our final scenario in the course. In this scenario, we'll be visiting the offices of a mid-sized public practice firm. Kay and Philip are both managers, Philip in audit and Kay in tax. As we join them, Philip is just arriving at Kay's office. Hey Kay, have you got a minute? Sure, Philip. Come on in. What's up? Well, I need a sounding board. Sound away. I'm all ears. Well, you know that Jazz is leaving in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And I've been asked by the partners to recommend who should be promoted to take Jazz's spot as supervising senior. And I'm facing a bit of a dilemma. I've narrowed down my recommendations to two people. One of them, let's call the person candidate A, is the best performer on the team in terms of chargeable hours and recovery rate on files. No question. Definitely a go-getter and really upwardly mobile. But I suspect that they're booking time to files based more on what the budget can bear rather than based on the time that they actually spent to make sure that the numbers come out favorably. And I've heard them talking to clients a couple of times where they were maybe a little bit more lax than I would like in terms of the audit, sort of jokingly implying that we might turn a blind eye on a couple of things. Nothing that I think actually impacted an audit, of course, but I just get the sense sometimes that they're a little bit too cozy with uh, some of the clients. Mm, okay. And candidate B? Well, candidate B is very professional, careful, diligent, and thorough, but unfortunately their numbers aren't as good. They tend to go over budget at times, and maybe they have a tendency to be too cautious. And that's, of course, where my dilemma comes in. Jazz was on a lot of my files, and so his replacement is going to be on a lot of my files too. And I'd rather work with candidate B, and I think that the audit quality is going to be better, but I also think my recovery numbers are are not going to be as good, and that I'm going to be spending a fair amount of time having to explain that to the partners. It's not like candidate A has actually done anything wrong. So if you were Kay, what would you tell Philip? Or if you were Philip, what would you do? From the perspective of middle management, your role in the measuring and monitoring function will likely include feeding information into the system and potentially also evaluating information on how well the systems are functioning. Performance reviews are a common place for this kind of input to happen. You'll likely be responsible for annual or semi-annual reviews of your own staff, and in some cases you, like Philip, may be asked to evaluate candidates for hiring or promotion decisions. So this is your opportunity to help shape the culture and ensure accountability by including feedback on staff's demonstration of ethical skills as well as their technical competence. Remember the earlier discussion on the mood in the middle? It's the actions of staff in the middle and junior layers of the organization who have the most direct contact with customers, clients, suppliers, and it's their conduct that strongly reflects the ethical culture at the core. This means that when we review staff's performance, we should hold them accountable for the types of expectations that we've laid out earlier as being fundamental to the mood in the middle. Things like demonstrating honesty, acting in alignment with the organization's values, treating others fairly and with respect, and so on. And all of this is pretty straightforward in black and white situations, of course. If, for example, candidate A had been reprimanded for dishonesty in the past or something like that, then it would be an easy decision to justify. But the choice of ethical enough and more profitable, or profitable enough and more ethical, remains a tough one. So what should Philip do? 
Well, his best bet may be to take the discussion that he just had with Kay and go have it with the partners. If the person is to be promoted to supervising senior, then their habits and ethics are going to guide not just their own work, but also the work of the junior staff being supervised. How the partners react will likely provide strong signals about what they value, and Philip can decide from there what to do and whether the firm's values are aligned with his own. It also, of course, gives him an opportunity of helping promote the type of culture that he expects within the firm. Okay, that brings us to the end of our conversations in the hallway section. We'll spend the final two modules of the course tying all this material together by speaking with people involved in various roles at different organizations and getting their perspectives on how they promote and manage an ethics-based culture. Welcome back. At this point, we've gone through a fair amount of material dealing with the roles of senior management and the middle management team. And now in the next two modules, we're going to tie things together by hearing the thoughts and perspectives from the field, so to speak. So here's the first segment of these interviews. In this segment, we're pleased to have had the opportunity of speaking with Catherine Romanko while she was the public guardian and trustee of British Columbia, and two of her senior staff members, Rich Rennie, CFO, and Vivian Lee, internal auditor, both of whom are chartered professional accountants. So, Catherine, to start, can you tell us a bit about your organization? Yes, I'd like to. Um, the public guardian and trustee plays a critical role in the social and legal framework of British Columbia. Our office's mandate is to manage the legal and financial and sometimes personal and healthcare interests of some of British Columbia's most vulnerable citizens. We serve approximately 27,000 clients and manage almost a billion dollars in private client assets. So, Catherine, given that guardian and trustee are both in your title, we're going to go out on a limb here and assume that trust is an essential component of your work. But can you give our listeners a bit more context about the importance of trust and how it drives what you do? Well, I I think I, I can say that trust is absolutely critical to the role of public guardian and trustee, given the nature of the work. If we didn't have the trust of our clients and more specifically the trust of all British Columbians, in the office and in the ability of the office to deliver in accordance with the law and in accordance with high standards of ethics, we wouldn't be able to fulfill our mandate. So to give you um, more insight into that, I would say that even though uh, the, the laws of British Columbia spell out many, many different functions to the public guardian and trustee, they fall into two basic roles. There is the fiduciary role and there's an oversight role. When we act as fiduciary, we are actually standing in the shoes of our client. We are acting in a legal role to represent their personal interests. Uh, We may act, for example, as a trustee, as an executor, as an administrator. We may act as property guardian for a child or committee for an incapable adult. And in those roles, we are making very personal decisions for them, very sensitive decisions often. We pay their bills, we um, invest their funds, we receive income for them, we pay their taxes, we visit them in their homes and in facilities, we understand their family dynamics, we know their family, we know their acquaintances, we make healthcare decisions for them. So that relationship requires utmost trust. And it also requires that our staff are acting with the highest standards of conduct. It is very sensitive, critical work, and it requires that transparent and ethical behavior and a relationship that can be entrusted by the community. In the oversight role, of course, we are overseeing um, under various laws the activities of third parties as they may impact our clients who are vulnerable citizens. So we may be, for example, investigating allegations of financial abuse of a vulnerable adult. Again, for the public to have confidence in that, there has to be trust. So trust is critical to the role of our office. 
So, Catherine, your organization is different than most in that you personally are the public guardian and trustee. So it's not simply like a CEO who leads an organization. You actually embody the organization in a very direct way. And the whole organization supports your role. So what effect does that have on the organization's culture? That's true. The public guardian and trustee is the appointed officer and all authority uh, carried out by the public guardian and trustee is delegated to staff. So that really means that there is a personal ownership in the way the work is conducted in the office and uh, a personal responsibility. As the leader of the organization, the public guardian and trustee has to really lead by example. Um, and I think that it's required um, to have then a strong leadership team who also uh, not just follow the rules because the rules, but actually take pride in the standards of conduct, in the accountability, transparency, and take on that responsibility as a personal characteristic, as part of who they are as leaders. And we work very hard in our organization to make sure that our leadership team is aligned that way, that we work together, that we have a consistent message, that we are personally really committed to uh, seeing that our standards are maintained, that we take action when there's a breach of those standards, and that all staff know that they can have confidence in us to do exactly that. I think that our ethical standards of conduct are part of our culture, it's part of who we are, and we don't just take that on as an obligation, but as a point of pride. It's, it's something we value personally, and we do work on creating that culture within our organization. And Catherine, how do you drive the right ethical culture in the organization then? Well, I suppose it starts with defining the values of the organization. And it's something that we like to give life to, not just have words on paper. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, uh, it really starts with recruitment. We look for staff who share our values of uh, of our corporate vision, of our um, sense of community in service. We um, create standards of conduct, which are very comprehensive. They include a variety of things from directions to avoid conflicts of interest, to protect client confidentiality, to contribute to a respectful work environment, to maintaining uh, professional standards of conduct for those of our staff members who have professional designations for their requirement to maintain their uh, continuing education as professionals the duty in all staff to report wrongdoing, um, the duty to use uh, workplace technology appropriately. So it's a very comprehensive scheme of standards of conduct. We review those regularly to make sure they're current and still applicable. And we train on them not once and done, but once a year. And we require that our staff both review the standards of conduct and sign off that they have reviewed them and that they understand them on an annual basis. Our standards of conduct are a term of employment. If the standards of conduct are breached and cannot be appropriately remedied or corrected, then within the usual HR rules, it could lead to dismissal. And we take that very seriously because it's our obligation as employees in this organization. So Vivian and Rich, the same question for you. As senior staff members of the organization, how do you help drive the organization's ethical culture? So we maintain and promote a positive work environment that is inclusive, that values diversity, that promotes health and safety, that provides resources and training to resolve disputes, and has open channels of communication. And the most important driver is modeling the behavior that we want to see in others. So we demonstrate a strong work ethic as leaders. We have a positive attitude. We're transparent with decision making. We make ethical decisions and we support them with rationale and we let people know um, why we made the decisions that we did. We identify ethical dilemma situations that arise or that may arise and discuss them with others on the team. And we lead others towards finding the right decision themselves without necessarily making it for them. So sometimes like employees may come to me with an ethical dilemma situation and I may have an opinion of what I think is the right answer, but I would rather kind of ask them the question of how they think they should respond and kind of lead them in the the right direction so that they can think that way going forward. And how about for you, Vivian, as internal auditor? I think the importance of setting clear expectations is the key to um, driving the organization's 
ethical culture. In addition to the regular review of the standards of conduct and the staff having to sign off on it annually, we also offer mandatory ethics training to all new staff and for existing staff every three years. During the mandatory ethics training, we talk through the actual issues and some scenarios that staff can relate to. This training was originally developed with external help, but has now been taken internally. This greatly helps me in my internal auditor capacity because it provides me the ability to interact in a positive way with all staff and to promote internal audit's role and what the responsibilities are within the organization. In doing so, I'm able to get a better sense of where the tough decisions are being made, which helps with the risk assessment for the organization. Also, the organization offers multiple initiatives to make sure that the employees are supported in their workplace and have the tools to talk through some of the more difficult aspects. For example, we provide them with multiple communication channels when they suspect any possible wrongdoings. They can either talk to their supervisors, and we also have a whistleblower service that is provided by a third-party organization. So Vivian, you mentioned the mandatory ethics training program for new staff and that it falls within your responsibility. So how do staff respond to the training when you undertake these sessions with them? And you mentioned a little bit about how this helps you in your role as internal auditor as well, but do you have any other comments to add about that? Yes, they really enjoy the group discussions around how to refer and to use the standard of conduct and how to use it as a guide when they're faced with ethical dilemmas. It also brings the ethics to life for staff because they're able to relate to the scenarios that it relates to their job duties. So it involves a lot of group interaction and I think it's also good as a staff development tool. It also illustrates senior leadership's commitment to ethics. For example, Catherine herself also attends the ethics session as the management group. And Rich, what are some of the typical decisions that your team needs to make that have ethical facets to them? And what helps your team make these decisions? Uh, one example is the decision that an employee or uh, makes on whether to report a wrongdoing by themselves or by another employee that they've observed. Ethical principles outline the responsibility to report it and how the leadership team reacts uh, affects it. So reacting positively to honest mistakes will improve reporting. So, for example, um, there's an instance where there was a privacy breach by email whereby somebody sent um, a document that contained some client information to the wrong person. And the important thing was that they reported. And we have a, a number of procedures that need to be followed, one of which is reporting to the lawyer um, that oversees privacy. And so for the employee, when this when we make a big deal out of it, they may feel like maybe they don't want to report it going forward because it just causes so much extra work. But we, it's important as leaders to make sure that we appreciate that they brought it forward. This is really important so that we can take any steps to mitigate any impact this, this may have. Um, so really just recognizing that everyone makes mistakes and what's important is that we correct them and that we learn to prevent and mitigate them from occurring. Another example is reporting a conflict of interest, whether it's real or perceived. So training provides conflict of interest scenarios so that they're easier to identify and reminds employees of what is expected of them when they arise. And my last example here is uh, recording year-end accruals, uh, which often involve estimates, which can reduce or increase the, our bottom line surplus or deficit. So a deficit could have consequences to the PGT for not having Treasury Board approval to have a deficit. And a surplus also has consequences to clients who pay fees and don't receive the benefit of those fees because our use of the accumulated surplus also requires Treasury Board approval. And historically, it's been restricted. And so in these situations, we need to consider how gray or black and white uh, the appropriate accrual is. And we also have to consider materiality because we, for our financial reporting purposes, there is an aspect of materiality that takes into consideration how much effort we go into uh, determining the appropriate amount of accrual. What's most important in these examples is having an open discussion and working through the issues as a team is very beneficial here, including consulting with advisory committees where appropriate. Overall, I think we have a very strong ethical culture whereby staff feel comfortable asking for help in making tough decisions. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day to speak with us. We know you take the topic of ethical culture very seriously around here, and it's been fantastic hearing your perspectives. Okay, that wraps up this segment. We'll hear from a few more people in the next module, and that's also the final module. In 
this final module, we'll continue our discussions with various individuals in different roles and listen to their perspectives. So I'm joined by Serge Massad, a licensed investment advisor with the National Bank Financial Group in Montreal, Quebec. He is part of a team of five uh, advisors and executive assistants who are involved in investment decisions for client managed funds. Welcome, Serge. Well, hello. How are you? Great. Thank you. So what we'd like to get your insights on today is within your organization and your team, how does the organization promote an ethics-based culture among staff and throughout your decision-making processes? So uh, basically, the organization itself has very strict uh, guidelines with courses that we have to attend uh, every two years with a certain number of credits we have to take, which uh, actually is directly related to the compliance and uh, the uh, all the ethical sides of the, the job itself. So having us to complete cycle every three years uh, makes sure that we're always up to par to uh, towards all the changes that, that come and occur during uh, during the job uh, we're actually executing. Uh, the organization itself is also uh, gives us a very, very large scope of work. So we're pretty much independent in uh, deciding towards what direction we want to aim our, uh, our work. And uh, that makes it that more dangerous uh, if people do not use the proper tools or do not use the proper uh, advices that are already in place it could turn out being not so with good results on the mid and long term. So in, in, in reference to that and the risks that you've identified, how do you ensure that ethical decisions are not just a matter of complying with rules or following checklists, but rather that ethical decisions and making them are embodied in the culture of the people that you work with? So uh, basically, yes. The ethical concepts are uh, covered uh, through the continuous development uh, that is given on the higher level, but uh, we do actually add extra within our own teams through meetings that, that happen on a monthly basis, and uh, we do cover specific uh, ethical issues that arise dependently on uh, the situations uh, throughout the working year. Thanks, Serge. I'm joined today by David Ross, FCPA FCA, Chair of the CPA Canada Unified Rules Standing Committee. In his day job, David has been a professional accountant in business for more than the past 30 years, principally as a Chief Financial Officer. So welcome, David. Thank you, Brian. Good to be here. David, what's the importance of organizations ensuring that employees go beyond having an attitude of complying with rules and toward ensuring that ethical decision-making is embodied in the organizational culture? Well, Brian, that's a, that's a really good question. The thing about a purely compliance culture uh, is that it tends to be rules-based. What that means is that the rule itself is the ultimate basis of decisions. And what more vivid example of that do we have these days than the Income Tax Act, where such huge amounts of time and effort are invested to minimize tax obligations without breaking the rules. At its core, ethics is about principles, values, and beliefs, which influence judgment and behavior. It goes beyond obeying laws, rules, and regulations. It's about doing the right thing in the circumstances. When an organization has made rule compliance its ultimate aspiration, and that is permeated all through the organization as its chief value, then it has undoubtedly raised significantly the likelihood that it will attract negative attention. Whether it's publicity in the news media, the attention of a regulator, or even the disdain of the public. It takes a long time to build a reputation for anything of value, including excellence, honesty, competence, trustworthiness, and so on. But everyone should beware whether an athlete at the top of their fame or a globally branded business even the biggest names can suffer harm and significant damage when rule compliance and not ethical conduct is truly the highest internal value. This is why all businesses should, if they care about their success over the long run, encourage all employees to highly value honoring the spirit of their codes of conduct 
and not just the bare minimum rules. Great words of advice. Thanks, David. And looking back through your career experience, what are some ways of how an organization's leadership can promote and advance an ethics-based culture? Anyone who's uh, been in the work world for more than a couple decades has the benefit of 2020 hindsight vision to clearly identify where and why things were done with excellence and conversely, where shortcomings in values or structure or processes resulted in problems. It is clear that chartered professional accountants are frequently privileged to lead or strongly influence their organization's leadership, whether in business, government, academia, or any other endeavor. In my own career as a CFO in several different businesses and industries for more than 25 years, I had the opportunity to strongly influence ownership and the executive leadership team towards an ethics-based culture. As a CEO, I was able to lead the organization and set the standard of how the business would operate, how it would treat its customers and other stakeholders, and the values by which it would be guided. Even at more junior levels in an organization, CPAs always occupy a position where our fundamental ethical principles of integrity and due care must always be demonstrated in everything we do. By and large, CPAs have a questioning nature, and in nearly every organization, we are expected to bring critical thinking and evaluation skills to not only our role, but also to the direction of the organization overall. Using these attributes can nearly always put the CPA in the position where he or she can pose the question, always directed to the organization's best interest, of course, as to what is the upside or the downside potential or the risks and benefits of a particular course of action. So whether one is firmly entrenched in middle management or at the senior level, the way that CPAs conduct themselves with their peers, superiors, and subordinates sends the message loud and clear as to whether they are guided by the spirit of the organization's code of conduct or they have a mindset where bare minimum rule compliance is most expedient, desired, and rewarded. Ultimately, though, leadership goes both up and down through every organization, and almost regardless of what might happen to be written within an organization's code of conduct, ethical leadership and promotion of an ethics-based culture really happens in the many interactions between employees and customers, colleagues, suppliers, and others that take place day in and day out. So whether you are the CEO or in a mid-level position or somewhere in between, chartered professional accountants are always in a position to demonstrate personal leadership in promoting an ethics-based culture within their organization. Words for all of us CPAs to live by. Thanks again for taking the time today, David. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much. So for our final segment of the course, we're joined by Dr. Patricia Harned, CEO of the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, which is the oldest ethics and compliance organization in the U.S. Dr. Harned speaks frequently as an expert on ethics in the workplace, corporate governance, and global integrity, and advises senior leaders on effective ways to build an ethical culture and promote integrity in organizational activities. Dr. Harned, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to meet you. So from a board perspective, most directors today understand that culture is essential to business success and that they have an obligation to oversee culture, but many struggle with how to effectively manage culture without overstepping their role and getting too operational. What guidance can you give in this regard? It's a great question. About 10 years ago, when I would meet with boards, I used to have to spend time convincing them that culture was something that they needed to pay attention to. Today, that is no longer even part of the conversation. Boards are believers that culture really matters and that they have some sort of responsibility to safeguard it if the company is going to have long-term success Um, if they're going to stay out of trouble. And certainly there have been a lot of instances of companies that have had big scandals. And in the aftermath, we end up talking about a culture where people didn't come forward to report concerns. But you're right. Most board members, they don't need to be convinced that it matters, but they don't know what questions to ask of management. And they don't know how to recognize red flags when they're coming up in the organization. So, The things that I talk with board members about 
first of all, is that they should be expecting that management is able to come forward with a number of metrics that are very important. So the first is that management should be talking with the board about employees' perceptions of um, senior leadership in setting a good tone from the top. That comes from employee surveys, engagement surveys. Um, they should be asking their managers to be monitoring the extent to which employees feel pressured to compromise standards just to get their jobs done. Um, that's a very big indicator that if, if people are feeling pressure, they're probably actually cutting corners to keep their jobs. Uh, board members should also be looking at employee turnover, especially in key positions. So one of the things we know is that the worst kind of misconduct, the things that really bring down a companies tends to happen at the mid-level and upper levels of management. So if you start to see turnover of people in those levels, it's usually an indication that something bad is happening. They're getting out because they don't see resolution happening. All of those are things that board members should should be setting an expectation that management is telling them about. One of the things that you mentioned was encouraging employees to speak up. And we know that you're a keen advocate of encouraging not just a speak up culture, but a speak up, listen up culture. Why is this an important distinction? And, and how can we foster that listen up piece of the equation? I am a big advocate of, of speak up, listen up. In fact, I think that um, probably one of the most important things that leaders can do, regardless of what their role happens to be in the organization, but is to foster an environment where employees feel comfortable raising concerns. I mean, we know there will always be, so long as there are organizations, there will always be misconduct happening. People do bad things sometimes or they make mistakes. What matters is whether they're raising it to management and making them aware. And so we've seen in lots of our research and, and in organizations that employees actually do want to come forward and report concerns. Most of the time they recognize a problem as a problem. They will come forward and report it. But the trick is that they have to feel like their report will matter and they have to feel like when they raise it, they will be heard and taken seriously. We also know that more often than not, employees, when they choose to report wrongdoing, they go to their own immediate supervisor. And depending on how that supervisor responds, they will decide whether or not to persist if they need to keep reporting. They'll decide whether or not they're going to stay with the organization. And that's where the listen up part becomes important. A lot of supervisors are really good at giving directions, but they're not as good at listening to employees when they're raising concerns. They're not very good at recognizing a report of wrongdoing as an actual report of wrongdoing. So that's why the other side of the environment where people feel comfortable reporting has to be balanced by an environment where leaders understand their responsibility to be listeners and they're equipped to both recognize reports and know how to respond to them. That's some great advice. And yeah, it's absolutely, it's part of a, it's part of a broader responsibility that we have as leaders that we don't always think of. A lot of CPAs work in smaller and medium sized enterprises. And many of those organizations don't have formal compliance programs, but they're still very interested in messaging to stakeholders about their organization's values and commitment to ethics. So what advice would you give professionals that are in these types of smaller organizations? Well, the first thing I would say is that if even if you're a small organization, you can still have an ethics and compliance program. And, and most organizations, I'm sure they have policies, they give their employees um, handbooks and manuals so that they know what the rules are. And that's, those are the basics of a compliance program on some level. What's harder to do is the ethics part of it. So my organization, I'll, I'll use us as the, the poster child of a small organization. We have about 25 employees. Um, and so in, as we have thought about creating an ethics program as an ethics organization, it is different. It's not, we are, we're never going to have the complicated systems and controls that a major multinational organization has. And by virtue of the fact that we're small and we all know each other, there are just some things that don't make sense. So 
as a 25 person operation, an anonymous helpline is really probably never going to happen. <laughs> and even if we have one, it probably couldn't be anonymous for too long. So um, what we have done is to first, we actually, because we're a small operation, as a staff, we have, we periodically sit down and look at our statement of values and we have a conversation about if we are upholding our standard of integrity, what does that look like? And do these values represent who we are and what we think is the way we want to do our work? So we start with our values and a big part of the effort especially in a small organization, is for me as a leader, for senior leaders, to make sure that those values aren't just a piece of paper, but we actually refer to them. With staff, we talk about our decisions in terms of our values. We periodically will talk about a situation, a case study or something, and relate it to our values. So we try to make that a big part of how we talk about how we're doing as an organization. Another big piece of it is that we, even though we're a 25 person organization, we have designated an individual to be our ethics officer. And that person for us is a staff member. It's a part of our policies that if a member of staff has a problem, has a concern, doesn't want to go to our HR person, they can go to that staff member, talk with them about an ethics issue, and he in turn will come and talk with me. So we have sort of a process that we all respect. I know if that staff member comes and talks with me that there's some ground rules for how we're going to have a conversation about what's going on, what's the concern. And it happens, you know, every now and then he will come and talk with me and say, Pat, you know, somebody's raised a question, somebody's got a concern, we might need to address it. So, so having somebody who has that responsibility as an ethics officer is actually a really valuable thing, no matter how big your organ or small your organization happens to be. And so, so we, we do have policies for people for whistleblowing. If somebody feels a need to go outside of the organization, what are our policies for protection of that individual? It's not as sophisticated as, you know, if you were to look at a major multinational where it's a very complicated system, it's much simpler, but but it, it's still important for us to be sure we have those systems in place. The last piece that we do, um, my ethics officer, who is not a senior level staff member, once a year meets with the board, does ethics training for our board, and also speaks with the chair of our audit committee just so that the board has satisfaction that there aren't ethics issues they need to be aware of. And I'm not a part of those conversations at all. So even those simple processes, I think, go a long way in being able to say, we do have an ethics program, we have a set of core values and standards, and we have a system for handling problems when they come forward. Those are some terrific tips. Most information that's out there tends to focus on the larger organizations, but it's great to hear some first line ways to go about spending resources wisely, focusing them in the right area and focusing on the values and the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Absolutely. And there are some good resources. I mean, we've got some on our website that are for, there's a toolkit we have for creating an ethics program. We have a report called Creating a Workable Company Code that's just a very, um, it's really designed for smaller and mid-sized organizations that don't need very complex documents. And it's just how do you, how do you go about framing it? How do you position it? How do you get all the input you need? So, so there are some things out there, but you're right. Most of what happens in our industry and conversations about ethics and compliance is absolutely geared towards the big companies because they tend to just be, unfortunately, they're the ones in the news the most, but also, you know, they've just got such sophisticated systems. It kind of dominates our conversations. Yeah, exactly. Just before we let you go, we want to commend you for the work that the ECI is doing with respect to research and, and the resources, including the ones that you've just discussed. Can you tell us what research or initiatives have been the most interesting or rewarding for you personally? And uh, and also, what do you think the hot topics in research, in, in ethics research specifically, will be over the next few years? That's a fun question. So I, I actually, I've been here a long time. So I've seen a lot of our research and I've actually, I've been really fortunate to have a, a big hand in a lot of what we do and how we frame it. So when I uh, when I first came to our organization, our National Business Ethics Survey 
was rather simple. We hadn't done it a lot. And so for me, one of the most rewarding things has been to see us replicate that study, grow it. It's now a global study. And it really is, it has become a benchmark that a lot of organizations use just to gauge what is happening, what are trends in ethics and compliance in the workplace, but also what are some key metrics that they should be looking at. So so for me, that's been um, a particularly fun project and one I'm fond of. In terms of topics over the next couple of years, it, it's a great question. In fact, we are in the process now of thinking about what's our research agenda for the next few years. And so the topics we're talking about are things like I mean, it, it's on the minds of most companies now, cybersecurity, increasingly the risk for inside, it's called, people think of it as insider threat, but it's been recent news in the U.S. that half the population has had their identities stolen through the Equifax breach. And so increasingly now there's concern that whoever buys that information has a new opportunity to kind of entice employees to give them confidential information to blackmail them if, for, for all intents and purposes. So that kind of insider threat, how prevalent is it? How do you guard against it is something that I think is going to be increasingly a conversation. We are, I think we're always having conversations about risk. How do companies measure it? How do they, how much risk is too much risk? What are the programs and exercises that help companies to mitigate their risks, especially for non-compliance? We're doing some work around analytics to try to get a sense of can you predict when parts of your organization are higher risk for noncompliance. So those those are some of the ones that come to mind most immediately. Those are some great, some really interesting ideas coming up, some scary ideas coming up, <laughs> but very, very, very important. We'll look forward to uh, to seeing the results of those research as they come out. Great. Well, I, we certainly, and we're grateful that people take a look at our research. Um, most immediately in the next few months, we will be putting out a couple of reports. We're introducing some new data from some additional countries in our global business ethics survey. And then at the beginning of the year, we'll be updating the data to our U.S. version of that, the National Business Ethics Surveys. Absolutely wonderful. Dr. Harnett, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and, and share your valuable perspectives. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.